So good to be in the house of the Lord. Glad to have you here with us today. I hope that you'll you'll get, if you're not signed up for that uh, Bible class, you'll get signed up for it. It's not too late to do that. Uh, we want to we wanna try to do it. I'm telling you what, now the two, just so you know, just so it's perfectly clear, the $200 is for the most visitor points that are here. Not just your regular points, it's your visitor points that count toward the 200 bucks. But the other event that you're going to be uh, enrolled in at the end of this, your, your regular points matter a lot for you to be in that. So please remember that if you would. And uh, let's take our Bibles and we're going to go to Colossians chapter 1, please. Colossians chapter 1. We're going to begin in verse 24. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, whereof I am made minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, where unto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Now, we're going to be springing out of this because the, you, you'll see a lot of great things here uh, in, these, in these portions of Scripture here. We see mystery that's been, that was hid, and it's been now revealed to the saints of God. And that is the mystery of Christ that's indwelling of, uh, in, in each of us. So I want to preach this morning with the Lord's help on the mystery of the indwelling Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, bless now this time. Bless your word. I uh, pray it would be profitable unto us and help us to see uh, how that you reside within us. And we in you this morning, bless everything that's said and done, have your will and your way in everything. We give you thanks in advance, in Jesus' name, amen. Now Paul in these verses is addressing the reality of the mystery of the body of Christ and the indwelling of Christ, uh, the indwelling Christ. Now at the moment of salvation, we know the believer is placed into the body of Christ through the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's how we are. Now, notice you're not necessarily uh, into a local assembly, but you are into the body of Christ. All right, now in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, the Bible says this, For by one Spirit, that's a capital S, that's speaking of the Holy Spirit, we are baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have all made to drink into one spirit. Now, that word spirit, it's a direct reference to the Holy Spirit. We're all baptized by one spirit, him, and that's not a second blessing. It's not a second work of the Holy Spirit. It's none of those things. Uh, it's not a separate work of the Spirit of God. But Now, baptism just simply means to be immersed or placed completely into something. So when you see baptism here, you'll see plunged beneath all the way. You're completely immersed. You're completely into the water, and you come back up, and then you, you're, you're raised to walk in newness of life, okay? Now, the body cannot be a local church. I wasn't baptized into the local church by the Holy Ghost. I was baptized by my pastor into the church. Okay, just so we're clear about that. When I was saved, I was baptized by the Holy Ghost into Christ. And Christ dwells within us. 
via the Holy Spirit of God. We're sealed into the day of, of, of redemption, the Bible says. So Romans chapter 6 and verse 3 through 6 says, Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Once again, we notice that this particular baptizement is the placement into Jesus Christ himself. We're identifying, we're linking up. When we, 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 we give our heart to the Lord, we give our lives and our souls to the Lord, he, he, he takes care of all of that. And now old things are passed away. Guess what? The old man's crucified at that moment. Now he keeps popping back up, and that's why Paul said, I die daily. I have to crucify my flesh every day to, to, to be that way. But then in baptism, we are linked to his death and being placed in the tomb, and by the glory of God, he was raised, so we are raised and then that, that's, that's what the scripture was telling us. Now in Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 through 28, it says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek Ne there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, what that means, that doesn't mean you physically are no longer a male or female. That simply means that you're a part of the body of Christ. We're all one. Okay, your individual, individual finger. You can't say if this, this, my, these fingers are this. I have three. I have three boys and two girls on this hand. No, it's a hand. It's a part of my body. You understand that, right? That's not what I'm talking about. All right. Yeah, I got more than the Brady Bunch. No, I don't. I'm just saying. It's the body of Christ in everything that does gender strife. Think about what are the biggest gender dividers, male and female, Jew and Gentile. Jews would have no dealings with the Samaritans because they were Gentiles. They weren't Jews. There's big, there's divisions. And now our, our country and our world, but especially our country, has made a much of extra dividing people. Because not only are you this or you're that, but now let's find out how many things you are as a response to that. On every, you can't even go to the doctor without trying to fill out what, uh, what, what you are. So I don't know how any of these new, new age people are even going to the doctor because they have no idea what they are. You don't have a, you don't have a box for that. Right, something like that. So we have to understand that Jesus did not want us to be this way, okay? He gets rid of all things that, are, that do stripes that we could possibly. So there's no white and black or there's no, you know, multinationalities. There's no racism in Jesus. There's no, there's, there's nothing. There's no, not even a gender in that because we're all into the church is the body of Christ and we are all that one thing. Therefore, we should be able to get along. The problem is, is a lot of people can't get along because they don't really think about being one in Christ. They think, well, I'm a Christian this. Because you're used to saying, oh, I'm this American. I'm that American. No, you're just an American. That's what you are. If you're a citizen of this great nation, you're an American. 
Why do I need to say, oh, well, you're an African American or you're this American or you're that? That's racist. You're putting emphasis on their nationality or their culture or their whatever. Now I'm all for you know people celebrating culture and whatever. And I'm not I'm not getting into all that this morning. I'm, I'm, but I'm not picking on anybody. Is what I'm trying to say. If if America would get get over who they think they are and get into what they are, th this country would run very smoothly. Oh, well, you get more privilege in this one, and this one is still, and, and oh, well, well not, and, and you, even men and women are in the same thing. Well, the guys are getting more paid than the girls, but the girls are more CEOs than men right now. You understand that? So where does it end? Where does it end? I, I believe if you can do a job, then do it. Do it to the best of your ability. And if your ability deserve you deserve that promotion because you're qualified for that promotion or whatever, then there shouldn't be anything looked at other than their skill set, what they bring to the table, and 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 do that. And put them where they belong. Because people that do the picky choosy thing. Well, I would, but I would rather have this because then we're going to have to do that, and then there's that, and no, 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 you're, you're, you're making it complicated. Don't make it complicated. If someone's qualified, then that's who ought to get the pay raise. That's who ought to get the job. That's who ought to be there because it, it's about the company that matters. It's the final end result of the company that matters. How we do as a whole that matters, not the not the divisionary things uh, that the world tries to bring into it. And a lot of times that mentality gets into a church as well. Oh, well, so-and-so and this and that and the other thing and this and that. No, we're all the same in Christ Jesus. We're all the same. We're in the same body. So there shouldn't be divisions among us. That's not intended for that. When there's divisions, it's because somebody or multiple bodies are walking in the flesh and not the spirit. That's all there is to that. And you know what? Not everything is as complicated as we like to make it out, but that's how it is. The simple truth is, is if there is division, it's because one party or both parties involved are not walking in the Spirit of God. That's all there is to that. So, now we're all one in Christ Jesus. And you notice here the baptism is again into Christ. Once again, it's not the local church. It's Bible's clear on that. The body of Christ, neither Jew or Gentile, bond or free, male or female, Listen, it's important that we make a distinct difference between... Now, the only, the only difference that you'll find in the church, and I'm, I, I feel the need now since I've opened the door and said that, I, I, there are things within biblical, biblical scriptural differences in the roles in, in the local church that were given by God. That women are not to be in a place that's usurping authority over a man. The Bible is very clear. This is not me. I'm not a sexist pig. I'm not a womanizer. I'm not any of those things. The Bible declares it so. The God made the man as the head, but he made a woman as a helper. But when it comes to his ch local church, he's appointed the authority to the man to, to be over the congregation. Amen. Nowhere in the scriptures, nowhere, nowhere in the Old Testament will you find a female shepherd of the sheep. Find it. Challenge accepted. Find it. Look where there was ever a female shepherd of the sheep anywhere in the Bible. You won't find it. Now, 
God gives his props to the ladies. Now, ladies, I'm not dogging on you this morning. Please don't get mad at me. I don't want you to get mad at me. I'm just telling you. In the local church. Now, there was a little bit of a different setup in, in now, you got to remember, like in Rome, there was already the church. They had to meet in houses. But see, the church, churches, you might as well say churches of Rome because there were many different groups, many different houses, but there were females that were owners of those houses that had church in their house. That doesn't mean they directed it. That doesn't mean they were over it. That doesn't mean they had any say in, in the pastoral matters or the financial business or whatever it is. They, it just means that they were kind enough to allow the church to be there and assemble there in their home. And, and Paul gives a shout out. There's a whole chapter of just women in Rome that had houses that, that they were told to, you know, be nice and be kind and salute them and greet them and be, and, and be cordial with them. But Paul was very, very clear that women should be silent in the church and even learn from their husbands at home. That's, once again, the scriptures. Okay? But I'm, I'm, not, here, I'm not here to try to stir things up. Except your spirit. All I'm saying is that inside the local church, it's a little bit different because of the setup of how God has set the local church up. But as far as the body of Christ and us being saved, there's no difference between a man and a woman. Because when we get to heaven, we're not going to be male or female. We'll be like the angels, Jesus said, who are neither male nor female but you'll always notice that all the angels that are, the, the names of any angels that were given, it's always a masculine form. They weren't wimpy. There, you know, there were no angel nerds. There was no asthmatic angels. There was no angel of allergies. If there was, he works for the devil because these are terrible this year. He was definitely one that left his first estate. <laughs> I'm just saying, we in, inside the body of Christ, we are one. We are the same together. We are in the same body, the body of Christ. Now, one day soon, we know the Lord himself will come for his church as a songwriter beautifully described it, I'll fly away, oh glory. That's going to be great. And when he comes, the next service time, most churches, most churches will probably have some attendees showing up. Unfortunately. But until his coming, I'm glad he's given to me his spirit. We hear much about receiving the Holy Ghost after salvation, but the Bible's really clear on the subject. In Romans chapter 8, verse 9 through 11, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. So if a man has not the Spirit of Christ, he's not saved according to this verse. The moment I came to Christ, I was immediately and miraculously changed. My dead and trespasses and sins got transferred over to quickened and made alive by the Holy Spirit of God. That's amazing. I was not, nor am I, perfect, but I was changed. And that's a key thing there. The Spirit of Christ is found in the fullness of the Holy Ghost, which indwells every believer. Now I want to give you about seven things quickly, and when I say quickly, I mean quickly, 
I don't have very much, I, I, I don't even have another page to turn to, so you can all breathe a sigh of relief. Seven points! No, they're quick ones, all right? And I got like 13 minutes before noon, I'm going to get it done, okay? We're going to look at this and let God speak to us through his word, because there is a verse with each of these. Very first thing that the indwelling of Christ brings is equality. What's the world hollering about? Equality. You find equality right in Jesus Christ. It's Colossians 3.11, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. We're all equal in Jesus Christ. Isn't that something? Secondly, the indwelling of the Christ will bring spiritual growth. That's a big one. John 16, 13 says, Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. Who is all truth? Anybody got... Who's all truth? Whoa, yay, we got some educated people in here. He will lead you into all truth. Jesus Christ himself is all truth. Everything the Spirit does is to get you to Jesus. So he will lead you and guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. Who do you think he hears from? Jesus. Those are the things he's going to say. And he will show you things to come. He'll show you from the scripture the things that are going to come. That we don't have to worry about that. Thirdly, see, we're moving right along. Please don't call me Kermit. Some of you will get that later. <laughs> moving right along. You know, you know, he sings that dumb song. He brings comfort. John 14, 26. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. That's awesome. The Holy Spirit is your reminder of the things that Jesus spoke. I like that. He brings love, fourthly. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. That's important. You have to be grounded in love. He brings it. Fifthly, he brings guidance. Galatians 2, 20 I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Remember what, I, what we talked about last week or the week before, that the life we have is not our life because we had death. We were born dead. Understand that? We were spiritually born that way. Now, we're, 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 we're protected, and I really believe this, that from the, from the conception of the womb to the age of accountability, and that's different for everybody, God knows that the first time a child will hear the gospel and say no or wait or not now, they've reached the age of accountability. All right? I believe there's a protection for, 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 for children uh, up until that point of accountability. And once we hit that accountability, we are accountable. We, it doesn't matter if we think it's fair. It doesn't matter what we think or feel. This is what God does. This is what God has said. It is the life I live. It's God living in me. It's his life. He gave me his life. He took my death. He took my death. 
gave me his life, his righteousness. He gave me everything of his. So that I could even stand before a holy God. He took everything nasty. He took everything sinful. He took it all and buried it beneath the blood in the sea of this forgetfulness behind his back, thrown for as far as from the east as from the west, never to be remembered against us anymore. He has all that taken care of, and he gave me everything he is. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. Well, get, look, that's exactly what we've received. You literally already, without receiving one more thing, have already gotten and received. If you're saved here this morning, you've already received every good and perfect gift ever. And it came from above. So, he brings guidance. He guides me. Sixthly, he brings a relationship. Galatians chapter 4, verse 6. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. A relationship. We're sons now of the Most High. Man, we're not just friends. We're family. We're family with God himself. By blood. It's a blood relation. And lastly, the indwelling of Christ, he brings hope. Hope is what we need more than anything in, these, in the day in which we live. We need hope. Hope for tomorrow, hope for this afternoon. We need that hope, and that hope is Jesus Christ. And there is no hope outside of him. Colossians 1.27, To whom God would make known what is the riches of his glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of of glory. Glory in heaven is our hope, and it's not an iffy hope. I don't have to wonder if heaven's real. I don't have to wonder if I'm going to get there. I have an anticipation of him coming to receive that which I have already been given. Heaven is already my home. It's not just going to be my home when I get there. He doesn't just have a home waiting for you. You already have a home. It's already there. The place has already been prepared for you and for me. I'm thankful for that. I'm very thankful for that. Because when I don't have anything else, I've got everything. I've got everything. I've got more than anything that this world could possibly get. Everything. Listen to this. I want to say something bold because it's the truth. The entire earth itself, with every valuable thing in it, from the gold in the ground and diamonds and jewels and rubies and pearls, everything, all the riches, all the wealth is not worth a penny to just what heaven is. Not even worth anything compared to what God has prepared. Man, that is an amazing thought. And you know, even if I don't have much of the world's goods or treasure, I've got more than the entire world combined. 
because I have a hope of heaven. I've got it all. He's made me a joint heir. I'm a son. And it's not something that he'll give to me. He's already given it. We're already seated in heavenly places. Already in the future, we're God's, God's in the future already. And guess what? You're saved. You're there with him. We're already there. It's amazing. And you see thousands of years ago and you know, all these multiple, multiple years ago, and then you see where John was called up to heaven to write the things down that would be revealed. John was taken from our past, far in our past, and put far in our future. And we were there. We were there. Man. What a comfort. No matter what I have here, I'm already there. I can't wait to catch up with myself. I can't wait to catch up with myself. Because my future me, he's living the dream right now. And he don't want to see me. Because if he was me, he wouldn't want to be me. He would want to be back where he was at, amen? I never have to worry about identity theft. Nobody wants to be a Baptist preacher. <laughs> amen? Amazing. Let's come for the invitation. you got two minutes change. Look at that. Way to go.